Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today is another Sunday episode, and it is one that I am really eager to get out there. And I know I say that often, but the reason that I'm so excited about this particular topic is because I think it is one of the core arguments against the goodness or the reality of the Christian God concept. Now, that's something else I've said often. So what I think I need to do is a tier list of sorts of all of the arguments against God, the really weak ones, the awful ones, some that are in the middle, and then a very top tier. This would be top tier. I've covered other top tier arguments recently. We've talked a lot about the problem of suffering, divine hiddenness. We just covered the exclusivity of God as a problem. But today I want to talk about the ability for God's creation to be deceived. This very concept, this very allowance absolutely obliterates the idea of free will, the idea of a fair and just God, of God's punishments being correct, and of him being a good father. So to make this case, I'm going to just slap you in the face with Bible verse after Bible verse after Bible verse. This is one of my favorite ways to make an argument, to make a case against Christianity is just to use the Bible. So I've made a playlist of all the videos where I've done this. This will be video 15. It's called Let the Bible Refute Itself. I'm excited to do that yet again today. And if you want to see more at the end of the video, you can click on the playlist. Of course, the playlist will be linked in the description as well. So let's get into it. I want to break down these verses and do a few different categories. Let's start with the initial setup. We're going to read Genesis 3, 3 through 6. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Okay, so... Uh, I want to talk about this for so long, but this is just like the verse to kick things off on a video about God allowing us to be deceived. So let's just try to cover this very quickly. We have a serpent, and many Christians still believe this to be the same thing as Satan or the devil. The reason Christians think that is because the New Testament ties Satan back to this. In fact, I have two verses just so we can make our case here. 2 Corinthians 11, 2 through 3, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. This is so gross. But I'm a afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And then also in Revelation 12, 9, the great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world was thrown down to the earth. So the ancient serpent is obviously kind of like a callback here. So that's why people think that. And fine, in terms of how the myth goes, you can really believe whatever you want because none of it's true. I'm building a case. You need to stick with me here. This is just the beginning to help us understand that this can happen, that humans who otherwise did not know better can be led to believe something that is incorrect and harmful to them, that is against supposedly the will of God, that none should be lost, that none should perish. After all, didn't God create Eden to last forever? Wasn't his original goal perfection, no sin, no evil, etc.? This should tell you how man-made and mythological it is that the second something can go wrong, it did. But anyways, this is just to show the setup. Let's get into some of the warnings. Then we're going to get into some examples. Then we're going to get into some of the worst versions of these verses. And then we're going to look at some of the consequences. Oh, and by the way, I'm reminded as I'm looking in the viewfinder that I have my new poster up. The room, guys, is coming together. I need maybe one more week, and then I'm going to do a studio tour. This is the myth of Sisyphus. It is one of my favorite myths from Greek mythology. And I think that that depiction is just gorgeous. Let's get to some of the warnings. In John 8, 44, Jesus refers to to the devil as the liar, the father of lies. In 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert and sober of mind because the devil prowls like a roaring lion looking for something to devour. In 2 Timothy 3, 13, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. I wanted to point out this verse because it's not just the devil that can deceive us. It's other people, it's false prophets, it's evil people. I also love when the Bible does these huge category claims evil people. What is someone just born evil? Well, yeah, the Bible would say that they definitely are. Then then everyone is evil. But what they're meaning here is that there's a secondary category, that there are some people who are so bad, that are so wicked, they're simply an evil person. It's such an obvious misunderstanding of human nature, of the fact that all of us are capable of doing things that are beneficial, more beneficial, less beneficial, harmful, etc. It's really stupid to just classify people as good or bad. But I digress. Second Corinthians, 
Corinthians 11, 13 through 14. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. So here we have it all laid out. We've got false apostles, we have just false people, we have people that deceive, and we have Satan, because all of these evil people are taking their cue from Satan, who is capable of dressing up as an angel of light of light. If you're a mere mortal, you know, us lowly creatures from the dirt, and an angel shows up to you, an angel of light, no darkness, Satan here is obviously able to completely encapsulate a good form that can trick us. How is that mere mortal supposed to withstand that? How is that fair? It's like a toddler going up against an MMA fighter. There's zero chance. And that analogy doesn't even do the delta justice. It's insane what a separation it would be between us, a human, and if this Satan character really existed, someone that used to be in the presence of God for eons, right? This essentially immortal being, how stupid we must be compared to him. So yeah, if he shapeshifts into an angel of light and appears to someone, they're probably going to believe what he says. That sounds like God's problem not the person's problem. But again, we'll talk about that more when we get to the actual examples. Let's keep going through some warnings here. Matthew 24, 24, false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders to lead people astray, if possible, even the elect. So there's a lot going on here. We have two categories of people. We have the elect, the people that God has predestined to be saved. And yet possibly, I like that it's not like quite sure, possibly even the elect can be taken away from God. Wow, maybe God isn't all powerful here. Didn't he elect for these people to be saved? How contradictory is it that possibly Satan could deceive them to a point where they are not? And then the rest of us are just screwed. If we weren't in God's will to be saved, if we weren't in his perfect plan to receive salvation, we have no chance against these deceptive practices. And then the biggest part that I want to get to with this is how are they able to deceive so well? It's because they have power. They will do great signs and wonders. In fact, there's another verse, and then I'm going to show you why this is so, so problematic and contradictory. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 10, the coming of the lawless one will be accompanied by all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and every wicked deception directed against those who are perishing. Okay, so let's lay the groundwork, and then I'm going to read you a few verses about how this is one of the biggest problems, I think, in the entire Bible. We have mortals, humans, who can already be deceived just by like another person with a bad attitude. But then you're going to add false apostles, false Christ characters, false prophets, and then the devil and his demons. And all of these will be able to do miraculous things, other signs and wonders and miracles, essentially, which God would have had to allow. God imbued Satan with his magical powers and then allowed him to have those magical powers when he fell to earth, if that is the part of the mythology you believe happened, then gave him dominion over the world, not only to lie, since he's the father of lies, and roam about like a lion looking for its next prey, but also the ability to shapeshift and look like an angel, and the ability to get into our very hearts and minds. This is already the most insane and problematic thing I can think of, but it gets worse. The reason people will believe all of this is because of all those great signs, wonders, and miracles. But let's read a few of these verses. John 2.11, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. So why did the disciples believe in Jesus? Because of his signs and wonders. How was the glory of God revealed here on earth? Because of Jesus's signs and wonders. So if another figure, another false Christ is doing signs and wonders, how how? Tell me how are we supposed to differentiate between the two? And don't worry, it goes on. It gets worse. John 20, 30 through 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but they are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I don't need to keep spelling out this problem, right? You guys get it. Acts 2, 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by his miracle miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. It's like the exact same wording and order that Jesus does so that we can know him and thus believe in him and thus have life in him that all of the false people and false entities and Satan himself will do. How are we supposed to know? Well, Brandon, don't you know? There's a verse for that. Ah, yes, this one. 1 John 4, 1, beloved, 
Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Is there a category for worst advice ever? Can we give this verse the award for that? Yep, you know... <sighs> bad on me. I set up a whole system where I told you you'd be able to know me because of my signs and wonders, but then I also gave power to my exact enemy that he could do the same powers and wonders. So you're right not to believe in every spirit, but you have to believe in mine or I'll torture you forever. So test me and then you'll know that it's really me. And if we were testing a spirit as humans, could we not also then still continue to be deceived by the answers we are getting back? Now, Christians will tell you what this verse alludes to is you need to test by seeing if it matches up against the word of God. Do you really think that the false prophets, the false messiahs, the evil people and Satan himself and his horde of demons are going to just do things that are outside of the Bible? That's why they're all so good at deceiving. I also want to point out every single Christian that has ever said, do not test God or Jesus himself when he told the devil that. The amount of inconsistency and contradictions here is mind blowing, completely baffling, utterly insane. I just want to go on about this point because it's so stark, but I'm going to let it go. I think I've made my case here for that. I do have a few other suggestions from the God of the universe, the perfect creator and knower of everything who supposedly cares about all of us and wants none to perish about some other things we might do to make sure we don't get deceived. Ephesians 6.11, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Yeah, that'll help. You guys know about the armor of God. What do we have? We have the helmet of salvation. Okay, salvation as in being saved. Didn't we just hear that even the elect could be deceived? So I'm not sure what the helmet of salvation is going to do. The belt of truth. Yeah, that's what we're trying to find. We're trying to figure out what's true. How do I just put on the belt of truth to protect myself from being able to discern what is truth and what is not? The shoes of the gospel of peace. Not helpful. The sword of the spirit. You mean the spirit that we're supposed to test because so many other spirits can deceive? The shield of faith. Oh, I'll just, I'll just guess. I'll just assume that I'm right. And after all, that's what Hebrews says faith is, the assurance of things hoped for, the breastplate of righteousness. What? What does any of this mean? How inept is this armor at actually helping us learn who God is, who the false ones are, and to not be deceived? Ridiculous. We're going to do a whole video on the armor of God because what? Some other bad advice on how to not be deceived. 1 Corinthians 3.18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. Oh, another nothing first. Another complete piece of nonsense. Don't deceive yourself. I'm not trying to. If I'm earnestly seeking God with all my heart, like I did for 30 years, my goal was never to deceive myself. And yet almost on a daily basis, Christians tell me, I'm just deceived by the devil. I assure you, I didn't do it to myself. And then the second part is just utterly silly. If any of you thinks you're wise, you're not. So become a fool so that you may be wise, which I get. It's kind of a poetic and weird backwards way of saying the only thing you can know is that you know nothing. That's not helpful in this particular case. It's great as a place of humility, but in terms of like actually seeing what is real and what is not, and this spiritual war that is supposedly fighting over my soul to know which direction is right, which way is up as I'm drowning here, that's so unhelpful. And then I've got a little gem of a verse for you here. This is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Now, this verse, I think the purpose of it is to make sure that we can always put the blame back on the individual. This isn't God's fault. He never gave you more than you can handle, and he always provided a way out. So if you ended up deceived, if you ended up giving in to temptation, if you ended up sinning, that was on you, bro. It's God washing his hands of responsibility, which that just doesn't work. If the immortal being, my great enemy, Satan, knows my thoughts and my feelings, my hopes, my dreams, my fears, and he can show himself to me as an angel 
of light. If he can implant ideas in my head, I assure you this is beyond my control. And God obviously is not giving a way out here. The way out would be to never have allowed this powerful being, this magnitude of power, come on. I have a few more verses for you, and then we're going to start getting into some examples. But Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Oh, it's beyond cure? You mean right after God tells us that we can always find a way out, that we can always find truth, that we're not going to have to give into sin because he is protecting us? We're going to be told that we're imbued with hearts that are by definition deceitful with no cure? It's too much, you guys. How about Romans 16, 18? For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. I put this in here because I wanted to bring it down for a minute away from all the spirits and the false apostles and false prophets. How about just the average human that is trying to get one over on another human and using things like flattery and smooth talking and that it will work on what kind of person? The naive. Now, here's my question to you. Why is that person naive? And I don't want to get into an entire diatribe on determinism, but the truth of the matter is is that this person, who they are, their genetic makeup, their brain chemistry, the way that they think about things, the trauma that has been inflicted on them that has maybe broken certain parts, any mental illness or irregularity that might be happening with them is most likely for most people outside of their control entirely. So God just creates people at different levels. And the naive level are just people that can be completely deceived by a smooth talking person, which probably represents most people on this planet. See, we do see levels from God because then we have even the elect. Now it took a lot more to deceive, possibly deceive even the elect. That took some real supernatural dark forces, but it doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum. God's favorite, his saved, his predestined, those that were blessed with wisdom and righteousness or all the way down to the lowly, the ignorant, the naive. We are all, according to the scriptures, capable of being deceived. And I should have said this right away. Let's just talk for one second. What does that mean, deceived? It's tricked, right? Like I think the word is inherently showing that we lose some measure of will or control. If I really wanted to right now with my kids' ages and my influence over them, I could get them to believe, think, and probably do just about anything. So if I talked my son into pushing my daughter down the stairs, would it be his fault or mine? I believe it would be my fault. I'm the one with all the awareness. I'm the one with all the faculties. My son is young. His brain is still developing and he's trusting as he should, as he was meant to, in the influences of those who know better around him. If I take advantage of that and allow him to believe that doing this thing that is bad is not bad, oh, it's not really. Here's why it's okay. Here's why you wouldn't get in trouble for it. Here's why she deserves it. I could even lie to him about the consequences. She's going to be fine. When you push her, she's going to fly, actually. This is the only way she can do it. Don't you want this for your sister? Right? Like in 20 seconds, I've thought of little ways I could just completely manipulate his mind. How much more could the father of lies himself do to us? So if it wouldn't be my sweet young son's fault, if I convince him to do something he otherwise should not, why on earth would it be any human's fault when the devil convinces us of anything, especially considering all the powers and tricks that God has allowed him to have and indeed gave him in the first place. Do you think the devil is some Prometheus that just stole power from the gods? No, God made him with these abilities and allowed him to keep these abilities and allowed us to be so weak in contrast that we are helpless little ants going about our business while the supernatural forces of the world play with us as chess pieces against one another. It is simply indefensible. So let's get back to the verses here. Here's one that gets quoted at me all the time. 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits. I don't remember doing that, by the way. And also the teachings of demons. Nope, I don't ever remember taking class lessons with Asmodeus or Beelzebub. How nonsensical. And then here's some actual examples of demons possessing people. We'll do a few of these just because they're longer. And then we're going to get into, if you can believe it, the worst verses yet. Here's the first several verses of Mark 5. When Jesus got 
got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. For he had often been chained, but had tore the chains apart. No one was strong enough to subdue him. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell to his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. I'm trying very hard not to talk about demon possession in general and all of the issues with it, all of the things with exorcisms or even the ridiculousness of Jesus giving mercy to demons, that looks a lot more merciful by answering their request for some kind of middle ground than he gives to people that burn in hell forever. And then I will mention by not mentioning, which I know I've done quite a bit here, how utterly sad that Jesus did that and had those 2,000 pigs die, not only for Jesus obviously not caring about animal treatment whatsoever, but for the people that were making their livelihood off that. 2,000 pigs? Do you know how many wives that could have bought you? That's just a little joke. All right, let's move on to one more example of the demon possessed here. Mark 9, 17 is where it starts. Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed, and violently came out. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer, except that wasn't a prayer, and this kind? So we have, again, a tiered situation of demons, some more powerful than others, and this kind is so powerful it can only come out by prayer? What do you think the apostles were doing when they tried to drive him out? Surely about the same thing as Jesus, the whole story is bonkers. But the crux of the story is, again, that it's from childhood. So this can't be about us choosing in our adult years to deny this God, which the vast majority of atheists who used to be Christians, that's not their story. They didn't just get mad at God one day and get seduced by the devil and said, yeah, I'd rather follow that. We don't believe in the devil. I don't believe in demons. And if this is me being deceived, when the whole reason it happened is I read too much of my Bible, that again sounds an awfully lot like God's problem and not mine. So I just labeled this next section, yikes, because I think these are some of the most damning verses. Revelation 27 through 8. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. Why do I bring this up? Why do I think this is such an important important verse. Here's why. This is like end time prophecy. Satan has been captured for a thousand years, but he's going to get a little little comeback. And with his comeback, what's he going to do? He's going to deceive. So God knows what Satan is capable of. He knows that with Satan on the loose, there will be people that burn in hell or get annihilated. Either way, separated from himself, which God says is not his goal. So I see this as a mirroring of the fall. In both situations, you have evidence that it is God who is in ultimate control. And it is only by God's choosing and his own time frame that he sometimes gives the devil the power to do these things. But then also sometimes he stops him. The word coming to my mind here for the people that are deceived by the devil during these times where God allows it is unfair and inexcusable. Okay, how about... Uh, I have two here from Jeremiah. Jeremiah, you know, the weeping prophet, the writer of Lamentations, potentially. The one who seems to really care about his people the most, mourning for their losses. He says two different times that God is a deceiver. And this one, yeah, there's some wiggle room here that it's just him expressing his emotions. It's not like a decree from God about God himself. But if this is what's coming from a prophet that we know is not a false prophet, according to the canon... Jeremiah 4.10 says, Then I said, Alas, sovereign Lord, how completely you have deceived this people in Jerusalem by saying, You will have peace 
when the sword is at our throats. And he's right. And then in Jeremiah 27, you deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Because it appeared to the people as if Jeremiah was a false prophet, because God specifically gave Jeremiah words to say, and then did the opposite, which is what was being referenced back in Jeremiah 4. Let's do Revelation 13, 14. Because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. Just pointing out for the last time, I think, that because it was given power, because these evil entities were given power. They didn't create it for themselves. God, the only, the creator, the most high, the all-powerful, had to bestow to them power to do so. And what was the consequence? It deceived the inhabitants of the earth. You guys remember learning about transitive property? If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. If God gives powers to demons and demons deceive people, then God deceived people. God's responsible here. This one will be familiar to you because I've used it often. 1 Kings 22, 20 through 22. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab into attacking and going to his death there? So God needs this to happen. This is, again, just clear evidence. There's no free will. God is like up in heaven. He's consorting, by the way, with his council of spirits. And he's like, we got to get Ahab to die. Any ideas, guys? And here's what happens. One suggested this, another that. Finally, a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. By what means, the Lord asked, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouths of all his prophets, he said. You will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. Maybe the worst verse in the Bible. It's it's up there. It shows a God that doesn't know everything, that relies on other spirits to help him, that shows how man-made this myth is, because it looks like a king and his council, and we see that all over the Old Testament. The spirits are obviously okay with lying and suggest to do so, and God does take full responsibility. It is only at his word, go and do it, and it will be successful. God allows it. God endorses it. God creates it. He's a hypocrite because supposedly lying is wrong. He's a murderer. All of this is just to kill Ahab. It just goes on and on. Uh, again, we need to break down this verse at some point. Ezekiel 20, 25. I also gave them over to statutes that were not good and laws they could not live by. Laws they could not live by means sin. And yet God says we will never be tempted to sin beyond what we can handle and that he will always provide a way out. Always provide a way out statues and laws that they could not obey. Anyone else see the issue there? Romans 11, 8. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see and ears that could not hear to this very day. Once again, just showing that it is God doing these things. God sending these spirits out, interrupting our free will, allowing us to think differently, live differently, or be deceived. Last one here, and then we're going to get into consequences, and then we're going to close out 1 Samuel 16, 13 through 15. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, David, in the presence of his brothers. And from that day, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendants said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Which I think that verse is hilarious, by the way. Like, Saul's pretty aware. But don't worry, this can all be cured with some good harp music, which is God orchestrating to get David in front of Saul to have this whole thing begin to happen. Again, completely eviscerating free will. And this isn't the only example. I didn't even have this one written down. By the way, there's hundreds more of all of this kind of stuff. But I'm just now thinking about Nebuchadnezzar, whose punishment is to have his mind taken from him, essentially. And what is that? That's for like seven years, right? Crawling around like an animal. Anyways, why all this matters so much? It's not just because of how unfair it makes our time here on earth. It's about the eternal consequence of such. And I'll narrow down. I had so many written here, but I'm only going to cover a few. Ephesians 5, 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. So this just perfectly lays out the correlation. When you get deceived, you will disobey. When you disobey, God will punish you. It's just not fair. If one is deceived, they're not trying to disobey. That's what being deceived means. So God punishing someone for this is like God's inability to understand motive. For God of pure righteousness and justice, he's like the worst judge ever. Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. You know what would make more sense if we just changed it a little? You cannot be deceived, for God cannot be mocked. 
a man reaps what he sows. That would make perfect sense. God sets it up so that we can't be deceived, and thus we are responsible for our actions, which also, by the way, to be truly responsible for our actions, we would have to know everything. We would have to understand all of the things that are indeed wrong. We would have to be able to know for a fact that this God exists and that his law is the correct one. And if you go back to what we were saying at the beginning of this video, we are so confused about which spirits to follow. And the way that we're supposed to test these spirits is so inept that I don't think any punishment is fair at all for any of these creations because it's so flawed from the very first ones with Adam and Eve. The whole concept is truly flawed. And I'm going to end with this verse because I think it's just going to sum it all up. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Someone asked me the other day, why don't you ever talk about universalism? I think it's because there's not a very good case to be made that everyone will eventually be returned to Christ when you have verses like this. Wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I think it's so interesting that the sentence that follows that is, do not be deceived. It's tying back in perfectly to that verse in Ephesians, that when you're deceived, you disobey or you do wrong. And then this is the penalty. So whether you believe in hell or annihilation, this verse is clear. You will not inherit the kingdom of God, which is supposed to be our greatest reward. And we can't get our greatest reward if we've been deceived. But by definition, I believe being deceived is outside of our control. And thus the whole house of cards crumbles. That's it. Thank you so much for being here. Please share this video. I don't typically ask that, but if you made it this far, do all the things. Give it a like, leave a comment, and share the video. Of course, it helps out the channel, but more than anything, I think it's one of the best cases against all of the claims from Christians about this God. And I'm always open to being wrong. I'm sure there's a verse or two in here that contextually speaking might not be as terrible, although I tried as good as I did. And I weeded out tons of verses I wanted to cover. I'm not just trying to take anything and build a false case. But if I'm still wrong about a couple of these, I assure you I'm not wrong about them all. And if even one of these verses is accurate, this God is evil and or cannot exist. So. I will stop. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for watching. I'll see you Tuesday with another takedown. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support, my iconoclast and GVI, Jacob, Joe, Martin, Oliver, Perry, Rocket, and Sean, my humanist heroes, Jared and Christy, my atheist advocates, Caleb, Sparky, Stephanie, and Todd, as well as all of my secular scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel or you simply enjoy its content, please consider joining these fine people. Thanks and have a great day.